I'm going to get started here. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, logging in and checking this out. Uh, I'm really excited to talk about this topic. Um, we actually had an annual plant native plant sale uh, scheduled for this week, and unfortunately, we had to cancel it. So we would have been distributing uh, plants this week, and, and right now we're inside and, and we're not planting anything. So uh, we decided to put on this native plant webinar uh, to kind of at least get you guys thinking about native plants and, and seeing, you know, maybe you can plan for your garden for next year or uh, start up a, a new hobby and start gardening this summer while we're all stuck inside. Uh, so we're, we're going to be talking about native plants today. Um, so pretty much I'm going to start off talking about, um, hold on here, let me make sure this is working. There we go. All right, so I wanted to start off talking about uh, Columbia County. Um, and the resources that we had here in regards to, you know, plants and forests and natural resources that we have. Um, this is a really great uh, resource to check out, you know, what kind of uh, important conservation areas we have here. Um, this chart is from a website called, uh, it's from the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage site, uh, and they have a conservation explorer where you can look at this map. And you can get a whole printout. Um, and if you guys are interested in checking it out, I can definitely uh, email you the PDF. Uh, but you end up getting a printout of all the natural areas in Columbia County uh, that are worth, you know, protecting. Um, there's a lot of valuable resources in there, uh, not only for, you know, economic resources, but we also have a ton of recreational opportunities around here, uh, opportunities to have more sustainability in our forests and, and mitigate climate change. Uh, we have a ton of biodiversity. We actually, I'm always fascinated by what I find when I'm out on my walks, and um, it, it's just a beautiful landscape that we have. And that's the other thing, you know, we, it, it provides aesthetics. Um, it's always nice once in a while to get out somewhere uh, where it's not as developed and you can kind of clear your head a little bit, especially during these times. But if you look at that map there at Columbia County, we actually have a, quite a bit um, of acreage in terms of, you know, conservation areas that are really important for wildlife and native plants and, and like I said, the recreational activities that we can do there as well. Um, so it looks like we have over 32,000 acres of protected land here. Um, that is absolutely awesome. We should definitely continue protecting those lands and maybe add to that list a little bit. Uh, we even have two important bird areas for migration and nesting, um, which is really great. So that's something else that we want to really think about um, is, is wildlife um, and how they interact with plants and vice versa. We also have some really great uh, exceptional value streams and class A streams, wild trout streams, um, just beautiful streams like the photos that you see down there uh, in the bottom of the presentation. Uh, but we have just some really great resources here in Columbia County, and I really wanted to stress that out, uh, that you know it's worth protecting, and the native plants is one way um, that we can think about protecting uh, our our natural resources that we have here. Um, and the bottom photos are actually photos locally. Um, so I just wanted to give you guys a visual about, you know, some people aren't too into going out and walking in the woods, and, and that's okay. Uh, but I'd love to at least give you some visuals about what is out there in our more remote locations. Um, from left to right, that bottom photo there is uh, just a walking trail over at Wiser State Forest. Uh, the next photo is our South Roaring Creek area, um, kind of like a bog. Um, the middle photo there is at JP Hollow, which is a beautiful old growth forest. Um, it's probably the oldest forest, forest that we have in this county, um, and honestly, probably in the state. Um, so really great, huge trees. It's one of my favorite places to go. Um, we also have a whole bunch of vernal pool complexes, which are really important for um, amphibians and reptiles. Uh, and a whole bunch of other types of, of wildlife. And the other photo there is just right outside of Benton, uh, right along the creek there on the hillside. Um, so you can see we just have some really great, beautiful resources. And I just wanted to kind of take a moment and, and show you guys some of those. So we're going to be talking about native plants. And I want to start off just, you know, saying why you should love plants. Because, I mean, I love plants. Uh, they do nothing but great things for us. Uh, at least native plants do. Uh, we'll get into the plants that are a little bit more of a nuisance later on. Um, but of course, we all know plants act 
like a natural sponge. Uh, they absorb a whole bunch of water uh, within the root system, and they also create really good, healthy soils. Um, and their root systems create some really great uh, pore spaces for water to filter into. So it's really great for uh, stormwater and flooding management as well. Um, and of course, those roots also are holding that soil in place, so it really helps preventing erosion, which is um, an ever-growing issue here in Columbia County and, and really throughout the state. Um, so plants are probably the best thing that you can do uh, if you have a, an unstable bank uh, to help stabilize uh, that. So you can also filter out uh, metals and nutrients that you don't want some type of uh, pollution uh, through plants. They're really great at filtering those types of things out. Um, they provide habitat and food for wildlife, which I'm definitely going to go into a little bit later. Um, they provide a cooling effect for soil and air and water. So, you know, on a really hot day, nothing beats going out under a tree in the shade um, and trying to cool off there. And of course, plants also sequester carbon dioxide. So that means that they uh, bring in carbon dioxide, they convert it to oxygen so that we can breathe, um, but they also are helping mitigate climate change in that aspect as well. Um, and I think that you should like trees even more than plants, even though trees are plants. Um, they provide so many more benefits um, just because they're, they're so large and they provide such an immense amount of um, services for us. Um, as you can tell, these two photos, that's me and my husband. Uh, we like to go tree hugging because we're nerds. Um, but you can tell that uh, we, we definitely love our trees. Um, and not only I talked about that cooling effect earlier, but they're so large they can act as a natural windbreak. Um, they block and absorb noise. Um, they also filter out a whole bunch of pollutants that may be in the air. Um, and of course, giving us fresh uh, oxygen to breathe in. Uh, and I mentioned sequestering carbon dioxide. Um, not only do they filter out the nutrients that we don't want, they actually provide nutrients that we do want to our soils and streams. Uh, they reduce soil temperature and retain our soil moisture. And of course, they're providing ecosystem structure. So they're kind of the architects of the forest, uh, which creates a bunch of habitat and food, and uh, really it creates the whole ecosystem. If you didn't have trees um, or other native plants to kind of create that uh, structure, you really wouldn't have um, these uh, habitats that anything can survive in. So they're crucial for that. Um, reducing water temperature in streams and ponds and stuff like that is really also crucial for aquatic life, like trout require cold water. Um, riparian buffers are also another way to reduce pollution, as well as uh, stabilizing those banks and creating a cool environment for the fish to survive in. Um, I had mentioned the erosion prevention and also reducing flooding. Um, they are, trees are absolutely amazing at intercepting rainfall. Um, so they will actually, a typical Pennsylvania forest will take up about 60% of the rainfall um, during an average rainstorm. So that rainfall that they collect on their leaves ends up re-evaporating back into the atmosphere. And so what that means is that that water uh, never touches the stream. It never even gets to the ground to be able to get into the stream. So by using um, and having forests, we're really helping to mitigate that stormwater like I was talking about earlier as well. Um, something that I just always find interesting and I've talked about um, in my previous webinar um, are the differences between deciduous and evergreen trees and how much water they can intercept for us. Uh, one deciduous tree can intercept between 700 and 1,000 gallons of rainwater every year. That's just one tree, which I just think is just so amazing. Um, but in addition to that, an evergreen tree uh, so like a pine or a hemlock can intercept over 4,000 gallons of rainwater every year. Um, so just imagine if every one of us planted a tree in our yard, um, how much stormwater we can really reduce in this area. Um, I keep talking about stormwater because it's kind of a hot topic lately, but um, trees absolutely provide so many benefits. So additional uh, benefits that trees provide, or not trees, but native plants in particular, um, and what makes these native plants more beneficial than non-native plants um, is that they really help reduce the need for fertilizers and pesticides. And when I say that, I mean that they are naturally adapted 
for the conditions that we have here. They're adapted to our soils and our climate and our weather patterns that we have. So these guys aren't struggling to find the nutrients or find the habitats necessarily, unless it's in a disturbed area. Um, but these guys are naturally resilient to any pests and diseases that we have out there. They're, they're naturally healthy and able to survive and thrive in these environments that we have here in this area. They also provide a more nutritious food and forage for native wildlife. And again, that's because they've been adapted to this environment. And those wildlife species have also been adapted to this environment. So they kind of co-evolved together, um, so which created a balanced ecosystem. So um, they are definitely more beneficial for wildlife because they're able to eat and get the nutrients that they need. Um, they also provide shelter and forest structure uh, for wildlife. So like I kind of talked about earlier, forest for kind of the architect of um, pretty much the landscape. And so really helps to build a habitat for those animals. Because native plants are non-invasive, um, they're very easy to manage. So they're not gonna go spreading out all over the place uncontrollably. Um, they're gonna be really easy to manage and not uh, require you know, watering constantly or, or constant trimming. They'll, they'll kind of thrive on their own. They attract and support pollinators, uh, which is crucial. And I'm definitely uh, gonna be talking a little bit about that later on um, and how they support pollinators and what you can do for pollinators. Um, but that is um, probably one of the biggest uh, benefits that native plants in particular can provide to our area. Um, they are also, you know, I mentioned earlier about how they are naturally resilient to our soils and climate, um, but also, you know, they're more drought resistant and frost resistant, um, again, because this area tends to have dramatic shifts in weather, like we're seeing today, um, and so they are a lot more adaptable to those types of changes. Um, they also have really deep root systems, which again, absorbs more water and builds your healthier soils. And I'm going to show you a really interesting graphic later on um, to just show you really the difference between native and non-native plants and the root system. And of course, they're, they're beautiful and they add a scenic value to the landscape. So um, I, I can't say much more than that. Native plants are absolutely beautiful plants. Um, sometimes, unfortunately, they can be a rarity to find. So when you do, they definitely always stick out somewhere in the forest. They're absolutely colorful and they bring so many um, wonderful benefits to our environment and just the landscape in general. So I keep talking about native plants, but you know, what does native mean? Um, and this is where it gets a little tricky. There's really no um, textbook definition of what native means. It's a whole bunch of different ones. Um, and this doesn't just apply to plants, but it also applies to you know, wildlife and animals too. Um, but you can see DCNR calls it a native plant is one which occurs within this region before colonization by Europeans. Um, I think in general, that's kind of the definition that most people go off of. Um, if you want to get really technical, you can look at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and their definition. Um, but for all intents and purposes, we'll just uh, stick with DCNR's uh, definition for today. So some threats that um, are threatening our native plants, unfortunately, there's a whole bunch of them out there. Um, so habitat conversion. Uh, you can see, you know, from logging or creating uh, corridors for uh, pipelines or uh, cell towers, they're definitely creating a fragmented system. And something that I'm going to talk about later on is those invasive plants that we see all over the place. And when you create a fragmented system like this, you're creating these open spaces uh, that are trying to readapt and try to get back to where they were. But it creates an open space that allows any invasive plant um, to completely cover that area before something else can come in and replace it. So you're really opening yourself up to uh, dealing with invasive species and, and making the problem worse um, as we develop these areas, even just small corridors such as that one in the photo there. Um, but even just, you know, building houses and, and businesses and, you know, removing some of the uh, ecosystem out of the land, um, you're really creating um, a, a difficult uh, environment for the, for the plants to try to survive in. Um, also, deer herbivory. I'm going to say, honestly, it's probably one of the biggest threats to our forest. Um, we have so many deer. Um, and they just love to eat native saplings and little seedlings, um, which is great. But unfortunately, 
there's so many of them that they're seeming to, to eat them all. Whereas they also didn't um, adapt or evolve with the invasive plants that we have here. So they naturally aren't very palatable to the deer. So the deer tend to uh, ignore all of these non-native plants and they like to eat the native plants. Um, and that unfortunately really changes the structure of, of a lot of our forests that we have. Of course, pollution is never good for plants. Um, so always discouraging pollution or over harvesting. Um, so if there's something like a ginseng or a wild ramp that you guys collect, um, sometimes people over collect. So you kind of have to think about uh, long-term sustainability for those types of things. Pathogens and pests, um, unfortunately, they're like all in consuming and, and we just keep getting more and more. Uh, that green bug right up there at the top is the emerald ash borer. So you guys may have noticed that all of our ashes are dying. And unfortunately, it's due to this bug. So what this guy does is he lays his larvae in the ash trees, and the ash tree or the larvae of this borer um, do exactly that. They bore through the pulp of the wood, uh, chewing until they become old enough to hatch out of that tree. And unfortunately, they hollow out the tree, um, killing it. And it also makes it really dangerous because that tree could fall at any moment. So um, they are creating a bigger and bigger problem. And it seems like there's really nothing that's going to stop them at this point. Likewise, that spotted lanternfly there is something you're going to hear a lot more and more about. Um, we have them at the very, very southern tip of our county. Um, however, there are areas uh, close to the Philadelphia region that are absolutely just overrun by these. Um, they are a fast sucking type of bug, and basically they uh, kind of secrete this mildew, which uh, creates just a, a great environment for fungus to survive and then ultimately uh, kill the tree that it was on. So uh, not something we're looking forward to, it's something to look out for. And of course, another threat to native plants are non-native plants. Um, so this is, like I mentioned earlier, these plants are creating more competition for native plants and not allowing them to thrive in, in their native habitat as well as they would have. And I forgot to talk about that last photo there. Um, of that of that tree with the fungus on it, that's actually a hemlock. We have hemlock lily adelgia that's also killing a lot of our hemlocks around here. So if you notice any of the, the decline in some of those uh, types of conifers, um, that's what it is. And unfortunately, that also doesn't seem to have anything um, to help us uh, try to save the hemlock as well. And, and, and as you know, uh, hemlocks are you know one of the most dominant trees in this forested landscape that we have. So if we lose our hemlocks, we're really losing a whole bunch of uh, services that the ecosystem provides um, to really maintain our habitats and, and also maintain our wildlife as well. <clears throat> so when I talk about non-native plants, there's actually a whole different list in, in terms that you can use to describe those plants that aren't native. Um, and of course, non-native means that they are um, you know, introduced or have come in since after the, uh, the European colonization of this area. And when someone says an introduced plant, it means exactly what it, uh, what it says. It's a plant that's been brought in intentionally. Um, an exotic plant is, again, it's an introduced plant, whether it's intentionally or unintentionally introduced. Um, but the two I want to focus the most on are invasive and noxious plants. Invasive plants are exotic plants, but they outcompete native plants and they tend to spread completely out of control and are hard to manage. Um, whereas noxious plants are absolutely the same as invasive plants and they also may pose a threat or harm to agricultural crops, uh, livestock, ecosystems, and humans. So that includes you know, poisonous plants and, and, and things that we really don't want uh, to be in the landscape at all. There's a whole bunch of different um, terms, but I'm mostly going to be talking about invasive plants tonight when I do uh, mention non-native plants. So the impacts of invasive plants, there are quite a whole bunch of impacts. Uh, we get changes in availability of water, light, and nutrients, um, because those plants just simply aren't processing those things as efficiently as a native plant would. Uh, we end up getting disruption of the plant and pollinator relationship um, between, you know, like a bee and a flower. So if you don't have bees, you don't have flowers and vice versa. 
Um, so of course, we don't want that to happen. Um, so they also serve as a host for a whole bunch of different pathogens. Um, so because plants may be related to another native plant, um, it makes pathogens and, and viruses and diseases more um, susceptible for the more native plant to, to achieve because it hasn't been around it yet. Uh, invasive plants also replace nutritious native plants that we have and lower their quality of sources for, you know, food for wildlife and whatnot. Um, of course, they can kill our trees and shrubs through girdling them. Um, they change our soil erosion rate. And something that, uh, if you notice in that photo there, that's a photo of Japanese knotweed. Um, that is an extremely pervasive shrub that is all over the place. Um, you could go along Cushion Creek or somewhere like that, and you're guaranteed to see this. Um, it just covers the entire landscape. And if you ever pull out a piece of Japanese knotweed, you're going to notice it doesn't have a really great root structure. Um, it's more of a horizontal root structure than it is a vertical root structure. So that being said, you know, as we try to stabilize our streams and think about stream health, um, those Japanese knotweeds are really displacing a lot of soil and uh, really opening us up to a lot of erosion um, and sedimentation that we get. So. Um, definitely, absolutely changes of erosion is, is one of my biggest concerns when it comes to invasive plants. Um, likewise, uh, we have natural ecological processes that um, are being changed because we're introducing new species, and we are also changing our community succession and what comes up after a disturbance in a forest. Um, and economically, the United States actually spends more than $120 billion on invasive species removal each year. Um, so it's really costly to have these guys as well. So here's that graphic I was telling you guys about. Um, if you look at native and non-native plants, you're going to notice that a whole bunch of native plants generally tend to have really, really strong, um, large root structures. And again, that's going to help stabilize the soils and retain water. Um, and you can you can tell by all of these plants that they are going to do a really great job at stabilizing the soil. I mean, some of those go down to 15 feet, uh, which is just amazing. And unfortunately, if you look at the turf grass, which is actually an invasive species, um, it was introduced a very long time ago, but you can tell by our lawns that they're um, very successful um, in invading our, our area. But you can see that they just simply don't have the root structure at all to make any healthy soil or water retention. Um, and unfortunately, that's uh, one of the probably the most prominent plant that we have in our landscape. Um, and I'm I'm willing to bet that that short root structure is because that grass did not originally evolve um, in these types of climates and soils, so it's just simply not going to thrive as well. Um, that's one reason why we have to keep watering and fertilizing our grass um, because it simply is not designed to thrive in this area. And then also, if you look at you know natural grasses versus agriculture. Um, I, I, of course, there's a, there's a place for agriculture, um, but you know, looking at these monocrop systems, it has really, really short root systems as compared to a native uh, grass. So it's just something else to think about, you know, when we're talking about improving our soils, we have to also um, look at the types of plants that are on the land, how that affects the soil. So native plants in the landscape, um, I keep talking about how they, provide a certain architecture for the landscape, but it, it's so true. Um, you have your canopy trees, which are the largest trees, um, and they're the ones that are providing that shade and really taking in the majority of the sunlight, um, converting those into sugars, and, and really um, upstarting the nutrient cycles throughout our ecosystem. Um, we also have the understories for so those smaller trees and shrubs, um, vines that are climbing up the trees as well. And then we have the forest floor. Uh, which is going to be ferns and wildflowers and, and other seedlings that are trying to come up. And you can tell by that graphic there that, you know, depending on where you're at, you know, in a forest area, whether it's a mature forest or, you know, it's a grassland that's soon to become a forest, um, all these habitats are um, providing certain ecosystem uh, environments where certain uh, native wildlife species can actually survive in. Um, so having a diverse array of different types of habitats is also really important. Um, so when, you know, choosing which native plants to plant in the yard or, or if they're going to reforest the um, backyard, um, you can really start thinking about, you know, what kind of uh, animals do you want to introduce and you can really tailor uh, the type of environment you try to work for um, with that in mind. 
that uh, as well. Um, if you think back to high school when you guys were talking about food chains and food webs, um, our grasses and our plants are primary producers. So what that means is they take in the sunlight and they convert those to sugars. And those sugars are energy. So, you know, the, say a tree creates a little fruit or a berry, the bird comes along and eats the berry, um, gets all the energy from that. Um, maybe the fox goes and eats the bird um, and, and vice versa. So that um, you have these food webs that are dominated uh, by these plants and these primary producers. And it's pretty much, uh, you know, if you don't have your plants or producers, you're not going to have any energy in the system, and therefore you lose your ecosystem. So plants are um, absolutely essential uh, for those types of things. So native plants uh, in wildlife, how do they benefit wildlife? Of course, they create habitat. Um, and what is habitat? But it provides uh, protection, shade, and nesting areas for animals. And um, you know, it's not just you know bees and other pollinators when we talk about native plants. It's, it's actually wildlife, like our turkeys that we have, and owls, um, our foxes, and our woodpeckers, and our turtles. Um, so we have a whole variety of animals that all require different types of habitats and, and they require different uh, types of nutrition. So having a, a, a diverse array of native plants um, generally will give you a more diversity um, with our wildlife as well. And of course, they provide food sources for those animals, um, such as nuts and seeds and fruit, um, and as well as nectar for insects and grubs. Um, so they're really providing a whole bunch of uh, services for these uh, wildlife. So if you're thinking about creating some wildlife habitat, you know, these are some things to keep in mind. Uh, what species of plant are you going to uh, plant for that animal? So native plants for pollinators. Um, so this is probably the, you know, the, one of the most important reasons why we uh, talk about native plants. And it's because our pollinators are just so absolutely important um, to to the way we live our lives and, and the way kind of the, the world goes around. <laughs> we need plants. Um, between 75 and 95 percent of all of our flowering plants need uh, some help with pollination. Um, so they're not going to be wind pollinated or something like that. They need an animal to facilitate that. Um, so pollinators actually provide pollination services for 180,000 different types of plant species. This is just crazy. And more than 1,200 of those are crops. So thinking about agriculture, we really need our pollinators if we want to have um, really good yields of food so we can sustain ourselves naturally. And thinking about that, that means that one out of every three bites of food that you eat um, is there because there was a pollinator uh, helping to facilitate that. So um, thank your pollinators every time you eat, you know, an apple or a tomato because they're the ones that did really all the work. So the thing about pollinators, you know, you have to think about what are our pollinators um, and, and why are they, uh, why do they have a relationship with these plants? Um, if you go back to the high school again, we all talk about um, symbiotic relationships. So that's exactly what's going on here. So you have things like native bees and hummingbirds, butterflies and moths. Um, so they go up to the, the plant, the sweet plant that smells really good, and they get nectar from those. And when they are up on that plant, the plant has the pollen, um, which gets all over the insect's body. And as the insect goes from plant to plant to plant, um, it is depositing pollen and collecting pollen and really creating a, a, a genetic diversity within the landscape. Something I find really interesting is some of these symbiotic systems are so specific. So there are actually plants that are host plants for specific types of caterpillars and butterflies. Um, and when you think about caterpillars, uh, it's not just a matter of encouraging butterflies in the landscape um, as a means of pollination or just because we think they're pretty and we want to see them, but caterpillars are crucial because they're a major food source for songbirds. So if you want to have a lot of songbirds in your yard, you should also think about really providing habitat for these butterflies and these caterpillars. Um, and there's some butterflies and caterpillars that specifically will only lay their eggs on certain plants. So classically, we talk about the, the monarch butterfly on the milkweed, as you can see there um, in that uh, top photo. 
Um, so that guy is sitting on the common milkweed, um, and he'll lay his plants there. And that's actually a poisonous plant where only the monarchs can actually consume it without getting sick. Um, and any other type would actually uh, die. So um, this is a really interesting relationship that they have. And, and again, you know, you probably have heard this before. Um, if we lose all of our milkweed, we're really going to hurt the monarch population. But it's, just not, it's not just the monarchs. We also have um, spice bushes, which provide a whole bunch of uh, different caterpillars, one of them being the spice bush swallowtail. Um, which you'll see there at, at the bottom photo with the blue butterfly. Um, again, it's a butterfly. I actually just saw one of those yesterday. Um, so having spice bush in the landscape would increase the chances of seeing those types of butterflies. Um, and another example I have over on the right um, are uh, violets, actually. So um, it's not just, you know, these great big plants, but also um, smaller ground covers like violets um, will host these uh, little capillaries. Uh, caterpillars which grow up into the beautiful little butterflies as well. And of course, we're going to talk about some bees, um, arguably the most important group of pollinators. Um, and they actually exhibit a behavior called flower constancy. Um, and it means that they typically will repeat visiting one particular plant species on any given foraging trip. Um, so they often are specializing in certain native species, um, and they won't visit a non-native species. So again, that's, that's the, one of the largest reasons why uh, protecting native plants is so important is so that we have bees that can uh, pollinate those, those uh, plants, because otherwise they're not going to know which plant to go to. Um, and of course, you can't carry pollen from one plant and go to a completely different species and expect that to work. Um, they need to be able to go to the same species of plant in order to pollinate them properly. 90% of flowering plants also depend on bees, which is just crazy. Um, but they really are just, uh, they really have grown up and adapted together uh, to surviving um, in these environments. So you definitely need one uh, with the other, and you can't have just one, unfortunately. Um, so thinking about this, you know, there's different types of bees, and the majority of bees are uh, solitary bees, um, with the exception of uh, bumblebees and the European honeybees, which are also um, an introduced species. Um, but, you know, you can look at these bees that are solitary, and that's where most of the majority of, of our species are. Um, that top photo there um, with the little big-eyed creature guy, uh, he's a blue orchard mason bee. Um, so you may have heard of those. We had uh, worked with uh, Central Columbia high school students to build some bee houses for our native plant sale. Um, and this guy is one of those little mason bees that can live in those houses. Um, they're extremely efficient pollinators. Um, it takes just between like 250 and 300 females to pollinate an entire acre of apples or cherries or some sort of, of fruited uh, tree. Um, so they're so much more efficient than a uh, her European honeybee. Um, also, on the bottom photo there is a rusty patch bumblebee. Um, that is an endangered species. Um, so if you ever see one of those guys, thank him for what he does and let him go on his way. Um, so there's also other species uh, that exhibit uh, floral specialization. And so those are bees like blueberry bees. They will only pollinate blueberry bushes. Um, which is pretty cool. And we have native blueberry bushes around here, so um, they're crucial for that. Uh, likewise, there's squash bees. They'll only, uh, you know, they'll only pollinate certain squash species. So, um, again, absolutely important for agriculture. Um, if you're trying to encourage bees in your landscape, you can check out that uh, chart there that kind of shows you if you want to have uh, some flowering plant uh, blooming throughout the year, uh, there's a great sequence that you can consider for, for bees. Oh, so some other benefits of native plants is that uh, it really reduces your maintenance for landscaping. Um, and I have kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, so you have less maintenance going on because these plants are more naturally adapted to these environments. Um, so they're able to withstand any of our you know, temperature extremes or, or weather patterns that we have. Um, and, and they definitely are going to be more resilient in that. And also thinking about you know, perennial plants as well, um, they self-seed themselves. You don't have to come back and plant them every every spring. Um, so again, less maintenance, 
Uh, in this case, they enjoy them. You don't have to necessarily plant them. Uh, maybe just uh, trim them up a little bit, and that's, that's pretty much all you need. Again, less watering because they're more uh, resilient to uh, our Pennsylvania climate. And also, we'll use less pesticide and fertilizers because if you have healthy plants, uh, they won't need any of those additional uh, inputs. So definitely some uh, benefits within the landscape. You can really consider creating like a pollinator garden and re reducing that lawn and, and reintroducing some of these beneficial plants. There's also uh, native plants are really great for streams and stream restoration. Um, and, you know, I talked about how the root structures will really stabilize those banks. Um, and you'll always hear the conservation districts really like to talk about riparian buffers. And riparian just means stream size. So it means the trees along the stream. Um, pretty much stabilizing the bank. And it also creates a buffer that filters any pollutants that may be uh, running through the storm water or uh, running off the farm field or whatnot um, that may get into the stream. So it helps filter that out, keep our streams clean. And likewise, uh, with riparian buffers, uh, you don't necessarily have to plant trees and, and plants like this or a live state, which are actually, um, you can use a willow or a dogwood and certain other species where you actually take the stem and you can just pop it right in the ground there and it'll naturally start growing roots and thriving and they grow really fast. So that's another way to stabilize the bank as well. Um, but you can definitely use native plants as a way of improving our streams around here. Um, you can see that before and after just how well they work. And of course, there's just an intrinsic value of native plants. Um, you know, looking at a landscape, we love to see color and green. Uh, and it, it's always a treat to go out and, and just hike in the woods with someone that you love and, and just really enjoy it and clear your mind. Um, that photo in the top right there in the corner there uh, is Ricketts Glen, which I think is probably almost everyone's favorite place to go um, because it's just beautiful. Um, and I couldn't imagine not being able to go there and, and be able to experience that. Um, so absolutely thinking about just natural aesthetics, um, you know, not, it's not about just how everything looks, but it's the experience when you, you know, walk through these areas uh, that we should consider protecting. And native plants are, are really going to help us do that. And also for recreation, you know, if you guys are into, you know, going for walks or biking, or bird watching or hunting and camping and all these activities that we can do in our forest, um, they, they really add a whole bunch of value to our lives and, and also to the community as a tourist uh, type of attraction. And we can really uh, utilize these forests in a beneficial way um, outside of just for wildlife and, and food and habitat for animals, but you know, for our own you know, mental clarity and, and health. Of course, uh, native plants are providing natural resources to so things like lumber and firewood that we use, uh, which add an economical value, as well as ecosystem services. Which, and an ecosystem service is basically um, something that an ecosystem does that benefits humans. So something like creating fresh air, uh, cleaning our water, taking in carbon dioxide, and reducing pollutants are just a couple of uh, services that our ecosystems provide for us. And if any of you have, you know, grown up next to a creek or a stream um, or a creek, if you prefer, uh, you you definitely understand just the, the value of nature um, and having nature available to you um, is just so important um, and it's something I just can't stress enough about. So who are our native plants here in Pennsylvania? Uh, we have a whole bunch of native plants. We have about 2,100 plants uh, documented here in Pennsylvania. Um, and of course, they provide a whole host of benefits to our ecosystem as well as ourselves. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to go um, a couple of species by species and just give them a, a basic highlight. Um, this isn't exactly my area of expertise, but I'll try my best to introduce you to some species uh, if you're looking at a nursery or somewhere to get a plant at. Uh, they're just going to give you some ideas about what options are out there. So trees, I'm going to talk about trees at first. Um, so I'm going to start with some of our oak trees. So we have a whole bunch of different types of oak trees. Um, this photo that I have here, red, pin oak, 
uh, chestnut oak is the type um, than what I have listed there. But they are just a classic tree, um, one of the largest trees that we have in this area. They create a huge canopy, a ton of shade. Um, and they also create those acorns that you see, and that's just a classic, you know, food for you know, squirrels and deer and, and things that like to eat those. So they provide a whole bunch of benefits. Um, I mentioned caterpillars earlier. Um, oaks in particular are actually uh, one of the best species to uh, encourage caterpillars on. Um, so if you're interested in, in, in encouraging butterflies and songbirds, um, definitely plant an oak tree because that is going to um, actually host up to 500 different species of caterpillar larvae which is just absolutely amazing. But uh, definitely one of the most highly recommended trees, at least from me, uh, that I can recommend. We also have birch trees. Um, this photo here is a photo of river birch. Um, so they kind of classically have that peeling bark kind of behavior. Um, and that's just kind of what happens as they grow. So it uh, doesn't mean it's diseased or anything. That's just how a birch is. Um, there's also black and, and yellow birch, uh, and black birch in particular is actually one of my favorite trees. Um, so if you ever um, are able to find those black birch, there are plenty of them around here. Uh, snap a twig off and smell it sometimes. Um, and it may sound weird, uh, but they actually have that winter green smell, um, and that's where you know if you ever guys uh, eat drink birch soda or birch beer, um, that is actually originally where the um, flavor and came from. Um, so if you ever find one, definitely snap a twig. It's one of the one of the best smelling things I think you can find out in a forest system. So we also have a whole bunch of maples. Um, pictured here is a red maple. Of course we have sugar maples and silver and striped maples. Um, so many different types. Uh, but of course, you know, sugar maples in particular will provide us uh, our maple syrup. Um, which is just a huge uh, economical benefit for us as well and, and something you can do in your own backyard. Um, but definitely something else to think about. And, and you'll notice as climate change continues and uh, affects our forests, you'll, you'll probably start noticing we're going to get more and more maples. Um, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. So we also have a whole bunch of hickories. We have uh, butternut, hickories, shagbark, and pig nut, um, a whole bunch of other ones. Uh, you can tell that photo there is our shag bark hickory, um, pretty distinctive bark, um, and also, you know, second to oak, they're probably one of the most popular uh, or dominant trees that we have in our forest, so they are, uh, they are definitely out there, hard to miss them, um, and they're always kind of a treat to find. Um, likewise, there's also tulip poplar, um, which is just a beautiful tree, it's really uh, yellow in the, in the fall time, and um, a great shade tree, or if you're looking for just one, one or two trees to plant in your yard, a tulip tree would be great. Um, and they actually create these little flowers um, that are wonderful for pollinators, and, and um, they, they're actually really just cute flowers that look like tulips. Um, so very cool, definitely something that I would recommend to uh, plant in your yard if you're thinking about a couple of tree species. We also have sassafras trees. Um, so this is another one where if you snap a stem, it'll smell a little lemony. Um, and these are characteristically um, really interesting because they actually have three different shaped leaves. So um, it's actually one of the easiest ones to identify because if all the leaves look different, it's probably a sycamore or a sassafras tree. Uh, we also have sycamore trees. I'm sure you guys have all seen these along our stream banks and along the Susquehanna River. Um, these guys classically kind of peel their bark, and underneath there's a grayish white type of bark, um, which is your younger bark. And they uh, are a huge, fast growing trees, wonderful root systems. Um, so these guys are really helping stabilize a lot of our banks that we have in the Susquehanna River as well. We have American beech trees. Um, so these trees, if you're out in the forest, typically you'll, you'll notice them, they're a little bit more smooth than the other trees. Um, classically, you'll find a lot of people etching uh, their names, saying, you know, who they love and what year, uh, because these trees are just so smooth that they're really easy to write into and it lasts for a long time. So people tend to prefer beech trees if they're uh, going to etch something into them, some special uh, message for something. We also have Ethan Hemlock which is our Pennsylvania state tree. 
Um, and I talked with them a, a little bit earlier, but they are just absolutely wonderful for habitat and provide so much cooling shade and structure for our forest. Um, so these guys, unfortunately, have a certain pest called the hemlock woolly adelgid that is affecting them. Um, but they're absolutely gorgeous trees, and I really hope that we can now find a way to uh, combat these little uh, fungus pathogens that we have that are affecting them. And we also have a whole bunch of pines. Uh, pictured up here is a white pine, but we also have some uh, red and pitch pine. Um, so again, something that provides a whole bunch of uh, cover for, uh, for native wildlife, as well as you know thinking about that interception that they do over 4,000 gallons uh, of water every year they intercept. So those evergreen trees are really important for mitigating uh, stormwater control. So moving on to some shrubs. Um, everyone's favorite is the eastern redbud. Um, you probably can actually go outside at some point and see that um, in you know recent days. Uh, they classically get that red bud. They're really pretty and in uh, such a great uh, landscaping tree as well. Uh, we have white flowering dogwood, which again is, is another one of my favorites. Um, and, and they're definitely blooming right now. Um, and, and they bloom a beautiful white color in the springtime. Um, and again, a smaller tree um, or shrub. You can, you can prune it however uh, you would prefer it to look. Um, so another great option. Um, another type of dogwood is the silky dogwood. Um, so these guys will get little berries on them. They're really great for uh, birds and other wildlife that will eat those berries. Um, and they're also something that you can live stake with. What I, what I mentioned earlier about uh, taking those twigs and sticking them in the ground and they will start generating some roots um, and start growing that way. We also have American elderberries, um, which are just um, a wonderful shrub uh, that creates these berries that you might um, find, and a lot of people use them as syrup um, because they create really great um, benefits for your immune system. Um, and they're a native plant, of course. That's gonna, they're going to benefit other wildlife and animals as well. And we also have service berries. The service berries uh, can also be pruned into a tree or a shrub, however you would prefer. Um, they actually produce uh, these little blueberry-looking berries on them that actually are sweeter than a blueberry. Um, and so if you're able to beat the birds to getting to them, uh, definitely do so. Um, definitely an, an edible plant that is uh, delicious um, and something that um, really benefits the landscape. We also have uh, winterberry hollies. So you may see these and when it's nice and white out during the winter time, these things are going to be bright red and they really stand out. Um, so these guys um, are really pretty if you're thinking about uh, upping your, your wintertime landscaping. Uh, of course, hibis blueberry is something that is native to this area. Um, if you ever find a blueberry bush, um, I highly recommend collecting some of them. Uh, they're really great, uh, you know, just fruit for, you know, ourselves and, and birds and wildlife and whatnot as well. Uh, spice bush, um, I have mentioned earlier about how we have spice bush uh, butterflies that prefer to uh, put their larvae on these trees and, and, and allows them to, to thrive and survive and, and become butterflies someday. So these guys are really beneficial. Um, and you can also make a type of tea out of their leaves because they naturally have a bit of like a spicy type of flavor and smell. Uh, we also have witch hazels. These guys are probably the last to bloom. So these are really vital to uh, our you know, pollinators who are struggling in, in the colder months of, of fall, looking for foraging, uh, you know, some, some nectar for them to, to, you know, gain their energy up on. Um, so witch hazel is, you know, classically a really great tree if you're trying to uh, encourage uh, pollinators and, and whatnot in your landscape during the colder months. And we have hazelnuts too. Um, these guys will provide a little hazelnuts you can collect. Um, but they're uh, a bush, um, or you can bring it into a tree, um, and something else you can use in your, in your landscape. So moving on to flowers, um, we have common milkweed, which is what I talked about earlier with the uh, monarch butterflies. Um, and we have a whole bunch of different types of milkweeds as well. So it's not just the, you know, the common milkweed, we have butterflies, weed, and swamp milkweed, and a whole, whole bunch of other species. 
um, but they're definitely something uh, worth putting in, in, in your yard if you're thinking about trying to encourage some monarch butterflies. Those are bee balm, uh, which is really sweet, and it'll attract a lot, bunch of pollinators as well. Um, these guys will stand up really tall, like you see in the photo there, um, and they're just a, a really beautiful, unique looking plant. Black-eyed Susans are also a native plant, um, and they'll create more of like a bushy area. They're generally a little more compact, but you certainly can see some spread with these, but it adds a, a ton of extra color to the landscape. So always like to see those. And something very similar is our purple cone flowers, um, which act just like the, the Black-eyed Susans, but they're purple. Um, and again, that's really uh, another great uh, pollinator. Uh, flower and it also just really kind of brightens up the landscape as well. And then there's gray goldenrod. And I know a lot of you guys probably aren't into goldenrods as much. Um, a lot of them are mistaken for ragweed, which causes people to have a lot of allergies. Uh, goldenrod, um, in, in most cases, what you're seeing, if you think it's ragweed, is actually goldenrod. Um, again, just like that witch hazel I mentioned earlier, um, these guys are the last to bloom, so you'll find these around like August and September um, into October. And again, it's another uh, source for these bees and pollinators to kind of get some last minute energy stores to, to survive in the winter. So uh, golden rods are actually really, really important. We also have New England asters, which are a smaller, more of a ground cover type flower. Um, they're just a, a really small kind of flower, and there's different colors that you can get uh, with these guys as well. Uh, we have cardinal flowers, which traditionally uh, will attract a whole bunch of uh, uh, hummingbirds to your garden, and they're just really bright red, so they really stand out. Um, so if you're ever in a forest, you would be hard pressed to miss a cardinal flower. They definitely stand out really, really well. We also have wild columbine, which is just a really unique looking uh, little plant. Uh, mountain mint, which is kind of our native mint that we have. Uh, this guy will spread and they do get pretty big, um, like most other mints, um, but also uh, another very beneficial plant for us. Um, and also put blue stars in here. These guys are really uh, unique looking. They're kind of shaped like a star and they have a little blue tint to them. So um, those are just a couple of wildflowers that you guys could think about if you were thinking about planting some plants. Um, just on that note, I'm uh, not really going to go through too many of these because I kind of already touched on them, but there are um, edible and medicinal plants um, as well. So, you know, if you're, you're not as into providing wildlife habitat or protecting pollinators, you know, you can also look at these plants as a means of, you know, just collecting your own uh, foods and, and harvesting themselves to enjoy. Um, persimmons are absolutely a favorite of, of a lot of people. Um, and you can, you know, raise your own elderberries and blueberries, um, you know, your uh, wild plums or your hazelnuts. Uh, tea berries are out and about this time of year. Um, I was out somewhere the other day and they were just everywhere. So, um, you know, and even sugar maples, they definitely provide uh, opportunities for people to uh, harvest their own food. Um, so that could be another benefit if you're thinking about maybe doing like a forest garden. So I'm going to touch on some invasive plants. Um, there's a whole bunch of them. And I had talked about invasive plants earlier and how uh, they're really just not beneficial at all for us and they really wreak havoc across our uh, ecosystem. So I'm going to focus more on the more locally prominent species that I've run into the most. Uh, I'm going to start with Japanese barberry. Um, so this guy is kind of a shrubby thing. He's a, he's a barberry. So he's got uh, these little barbs that'll catch on to you, little thorns, and he also develops a, a little tiny red berry, um, which is actually a favorite for some animals, and some, some of the birds will eat those. Um, but unfortunately, these guys um, have been found to really increase tick uh, occurrences in the landscape. So this, for some reason, ticks really seem to enjoy being um, on and around Japanese barberry. Um, so if you ever have those or find those in your yard, um, by all means, try to get them out as best as you can. Those have multi flower rose, which um, is just as, as invasive as the barberry. Um, see that one pretty frequently as well. And again, it's just this uh, barbed rose plant that spreads rapidly um, and doesn't help native 
wildlife or, or plants at all um, because it just simply doesn't provide the structure or the food system. We have Japanese honeysuckle, um, which we actually have a whole bunch of different types of honeysuckles that are really becoming a problem in Pennsylvania. And you can see, again, they're, they're spreading all over the place and they're not allowing for any open areas for other plants to, to survive. There's Tree of Heaven, which is the favorite plant of the spotted lanternfly. So unfortunately, we have both of those. Um, and this guy looks like uh, one of those staghorn sumac, um, but it is not a sumac. And they actually smell like rotten peanut butter, um, or I'd actually describe it as cat urine. Um, they are nasty trees and really hard to remove. Um, and unfortunately, they're very attractive, attractive to the spotted lantern fly. So um, definitely another nuisance species that we want to try to get rid of. There's Japanese silk grass. Um, so that one's a type of grass, it's just going to cover a forest floor. Um, unfortunately, I have a whole bunch of this in my own backyard I'm trying to deal with. Um, but this one, definitely, I, I hard pressed to not find silk grass more and more as I go to different sites. Um, this is definitely um, a problem and <laughs> very hard to eradicate because it's a grass, it's just so pervasive. There's Japanese knotweed, uh, which I had talked about earlier, and, and this one is just absolutely uh, such a headache. Um, it looks like a bamboo. Um, it's actually a favorite for pollinators. They actually really enjoy these, um, but unfortunately, it just has no root structure to stabilize banks, um, and it's huge. It's a, it's a massive plant. It spreads rapidly. Um, it has these rhizomes, so it's really hard to kill them because they don't necessarily have a root structure. Um, they're, they're working on these little rhizomes, which are really hard to pull uh, out of the soil. Um, so just an absolute nuisance, and you'll almost always find these along our stream banks. Um, guaranteed you're going to find these. They're starting to, to grow up right now, and they just look like little bamboos. And then there's also mile a minute weed, which is probably my least favorite of all of these guys. Not that I have any favorites. Um, but this guy literally will grow what you think is a mile a minute. Uh, they, they grow fast. They're a vine. Um, they also have these little prickly things on them that help them attach to different you know, plants and structures. And they truly will just cover a structure or a plant. Um, of course, that really inhibits survival of other plants or any other plants trying to you know, grow in that region. Um, and just it's uh, absolutely a pest. Um, and I unfortunately, we have a whole bunch of them around this area. So if you do find an invasive plant, you know, first things first, you know, identify what type of plant that is. Um, I can help you out with that, or there's, there's um, I use an app called iNaturalist. You actually can just take a photo of your plant, and it'll give you suggestions on, on what it looks like and what, what is similar to, to that. So um, that is something that I definitely recommend. But identify that plant species. And then do some research on it, figure out what you can do to remove it. Um, or you can even consult, you know, your local service forester or myself. Um, you can come out and we can talk to you about different strategies for removing these plants. And you want to create a management plan. Because unfortunately, these invasive plants don't go away once you get rid of them. Um, it's very hard to get rid of them. So it's more of a maintenance thing than an eradication type of thing. So you'll want to plan. Um, at least for five years in, in mitigating these, these species and trying to reduce the spread. You want to treat the site, whether it's mechanically or uh, chemically. Um, you know, that's, it can be difficult to do it mechanically if you have something like Japanese barberry. Um, but, you know, ideally, more organic methods would be preferred, but in some cases, you will have to use some uh, natural herbicides. Um, ongoing monitoring is key. You'll want to keep watching the area and any. Uh, sign of um, re-emergence is something that you want to definitely go and address. And you want to re replace those plants that you removed with native plants and really try to encourage them and protect them so that they can uh, grow and replace that plant as well. Um, so just on that note, you know, I just want to touch a little bit on our, our Pennsylvania rare and threatened and endangered plants that we have. Unfortunately, we have a whole bunch of them. Um, so we have about 349 rare, threatened, or endangered plants in Pennsylvania. Um, that's just that's a lot. And unfortunately, it's due to uh, habitat loss and the forest fragmentation I talked about earlier, um, comp competing with invasive plants, uh, creating edge habitat, 
as we remove more and more forests, um, we're adding more of the edges of those forests. Uh, also, deer browsing is, is really hurting them as well as harvesting um, and decline in pollinators. You know, I keep mentioning, you know, if we don't have uh, flowers, we don't have pollinators. Um, and same thing, if we don't have pollinators, we're not going to have flowers. Um, and, and as well as wildlife that, you know, will disperse seed uh, through other means um, and not just pollination. And also climate change. Climate change is something that we're, you know, we're going to have to deal with. Um, and plants absolutely are going to be affected by it because uh, there's going to be an increase in heat, uh, rainfall patterns, and just different seasonal shifts. Um, so something like, think about tonight, it's uh, May and we're going to get a frost. Uh, so that's really going to be um, hard, not just for agriculture, um, but these native plants are just simply not used to that type of, of climatic pattern. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if they survive it. Um, and hopefully they'll be more resilient and maybe we'll get lucky and we can get rid of all of our uh, invasive plants. So we'll see. And uh, I put a link there too, and, and I'll have this PowerPoint up on our website later on, but if you want to check out that link, it'll, it'll give you more details of what invasive or what uh, endangered plants we do have and, and, and so you can try to plant them and help them out or at least be able to identify them. And touching on that climate change, you know, I just want to talk about, you know, we're going to have to face that um, our forests are going to change. Um, of course, I don't want our forests to be overrun by invasive species and change and no longer be beneficial to us, but we need to start thinking about climate change and how plants are reacting to that. Um, so a lot of people think that as we have more CO2, uh, plants are going to be happier because that's kind of what they bring in. Um, but unfortunately, there's been a whole bunch of different studies that actually show that that's the opposite case. Um, so they've actually found that as you increase CO2 levels in the air, the nutritional quality of those plants um, are actually going to decrease. That's really not good for crops and humans that are using these primarily as their source of food. Um, so there's a really great TED talk on that. I definitely highly recommend you guys go over to YouTube after this and check that one out. It's very interesting. Um, but also, you know, growth and forest regeneration. Um, again, uh, studies have found that actually high levels of CO2 are going to slow the growth of trees, um, which is going to really slow our rate of regeneration, uh, which is concerning. You know, there's a big push to plant trees out there, um, try to reforest things to mitigate climate change. Um, but it's going to be a lot harder to do it when we start realizing that these trees are not growing as fast as we expected them to. <laughs> uh, we also have um, not only that, but we also have community change. Um, as you have species, like you can see um, in the uh, chart there, some of these species are, are going to decline and we're going to get more species. Um, so there's definitely going to be a change in the diversity um, and dominance of, of trees within our forest. Um, and, and, you know, looking at, you know, resilient trees, uh, I have maple versus oak there. Um, and oaks are actually, unfortunately, starting to also die off. They're not as healthy. Um, especially out west, they have um, sudden oak disease, uh, which is basically where they just die for no reason and is unidentified. Um, so unfortunately, that's, that's starting to come out eastward. Uh, and it looks like through a lot of whole bunch of research that um, the maples are probably next to Dominator Forest. So that top photo there is, a, is an oak forest, and that bottom photo, that bottom photo is a, a maple forest. So um, the way our forests look and function may actually change over time. Um, so fortunately, we do have our, our native maples. So if you're thinking about replanting or reforesting some you know, section of your yard, uh, definitely consider looking into you know oaks to protect them, but also maples because as we have climate change, um, they're more likely to survive, and the more trees, the better. Some other trees that are going to be resilient to, to climate change are sycamore trees. Um, box elders and eastern redbuds. Um, there's a whole bunch of other plants. And again, if you guys are interested in that information, I can send them over to you. But you can see on that chart there uh, what is more likely to, to increase or decrease over time. So ways that you can help native plants. Uh, of course, you want to minimize habitat destruction. So 
you know, minifying, you know, removing our forests or grasslands or wetlands or whatever ecosystem you live near, uh, really trying to protect those areas. Also using native land, uh, plants for landscaping. Um, you can think about doing a no mow zone in your yard, um, which we just did a, a whole webinar on last week. So if you guys want to check that out and figure out how you can use native plants in your landscaping, uh, go to our website and you can see the presentation there. Um, just kind of educate yourself a little more about native plants and identifying them. And, uh, you know, the more you know about plants, to be able to see them in the wild more and really appreciate them. Um, and it can give you a good pulse on, like, what the health of an ecosystem is. Um, you want to buy and encourage nurseries to offer uh, native plants um, and also not remove plants from the wild. So I do prefer you guys start from seed or go to a nursery. Um, you definitely don't want to take something out of the wild. If it's there, it means that it's thriving and it's happy. Uh, so we want to keep it that way. Um, also, choosing the right plant for the site that you're on. Um, you know, you don't want to plant a, a, a type of plant that prefers wet areas if you're, you know, in a really dry upland area. So you want to look at your soil structure and, you know, uh, access to sunlight um, and see what type of plant might be right for your area to increase the chances of survival. And of course, you're going to want to remove any uh, invasive and non-native plants as well. So if you're looking to get some native plants, um, definitely nursery, nursery, greenhouses, and gardening centers. Now, in most cases, you may have to uh, go to a specialized one of those. A lot of local nurseries and greenhouses um, may offer native perennial plants. Um, but really just encourage them, give them your feedback, uh, less, less annuals, more perennials, uh, try, more native plants, um, and, and definitely try to encourage your local nurseries. But there are some out there that, that will uh, provide native plants for you. Uh, of course, you can also start from seed or use a whole like seed mix for like a pollinator mix or for, you know, if you're trying to attract deers or deer mixes and hummingbird mixes. Um, so they're definitely out there. And then also you can attend any, you know, annual native plant sale, like what we do at the conservation district. Uh, most conservation districts uh, will offer that. There's also um, a bunch of uh, societies and organizations that also offer these types of sales. And if there's a, a native plant sale in Pennsylvania every year um, at the Native Plant Festival. Um, so there's definitely some options for you guys to definitely get out there and, and try to plant some of these seeds. Uh, if you're looking for a specific list of nurseries that provide native plants, PCNR was ahead of you on that one. Um, so again, uh, you can check out that website. I'll have this PowerPoint up uh, so you guys can always uh, find that uh, website link again later on. Um, and that will list uh, all the nurseries in Pennsylvania that provide native plants. And of course, you know, the reason why we're doing this webinar is because unfortunately uh, we can't uh, host our, our annual native plant sale this year. Um, we would have been handing out plants, plants as we speak uh, right now, but unfortunately we weren't able to. But uh, we promise we'll try our best to bring it back next year. Um, typically, the pre-order is between uh, January and March. So if you guys want to um, head out there and get in our newsletter to get updates, um, we certainly will send you some email updates and let you know when the plant orders are ready to be put in. And then typically kick off in early May, whether it's the, the first or second week of May, typically. Um, so again, sign up for our newsletter to get some updates. You can also check our website there for some more information, and you can see some of the plants that we've offered in the past. Um, opportunities for large-scale uh, projects. If, if any of you guys have, you know, an acre of more that you're thinking, wow, I'd really like to reforest this, or really would like to somehow uh, improve this ecologically, uh, we have a whole bunch of different uh, programs that we can go through. Uh, Columbia County uh, actually just last year became a partner with the 10 Million Trees Partnership. So they actually want to plant 10 million trees within Pennsylvania by the year 2025. Um, we've planted thousands so far. Um, but definitely, these are free trees with free uh, stakes and shelters. Um, we do have a minimum of 100 or more if you do order them. Um, but, you know, if you can get together your friends and family, coworkers, and, and have a planting day, um, I can absolutely provide some free trees. Uh, and, and we can also get you uh, native plants, whether you're looking for trees or shrubs, um, they'll also be available. 
Um, there are grants out there that are available. I can I can write these grants and get them for your property um, for multifunctional riparian grass buffers. Um, so you know, thinking about those edible buff, the edible plants that I talked about earlier, um, there's actually grants out there that encourage that, um, so people can consider harvesting that and increasing our economic growth around here. Um, there's a buffer bonus program which was designed for farmers. Um, for every acre of uh, riparian buffer you put in, they'll give you so much money towards another type of conservation practice, like if you need a stream crossing for your cattle um, or, or something like that. Um, that's out there. There's a CREP program, which I highly encourage anyone. Um, it's got some open land to check that out because you can actually get paid to put uh, land aside for those purposes. There's a whole bunch of wetland restoration projects that we could consider. Um, the Youth Fish and Wildlife is, is always looking for wetland restoration sites in our area, and I'm personally, I would love to do one of those projects. So if you guys are thinking about restoring a wetland and have one on your property, please contact me. Um, and as well, as you you know, there's uh, the USDA offers some programs, um, and if you qualify, you may be able to get some pollinator habitat installed. So uh, we have a whole bunch of different uh, programs, and we get more and more um, throughout the year that, that kind of come by. So, um, if you have any interest in doing these types of projects, by all means, just give me a call or an email, and I'd love to come check check out your property, and hopefully we can jumpstart the process. So with all that, um, I'm going to open it up to any questions that you guys have. Um, and of course, native plants or any other topic uh, that you guys would like to talk about. Um, we're in a little over the time here, but uh, if you guys want to stick around, I'll be here till at least 1.30. Um, so if you have any questions, you can let me know. Yes, yes, the uh, presentation will be, I'm hoping by the end of the night, it'll be uploaded to YouTube, um, and the PDF and the link for YouTube will be on our website. So just go to our website at columbiaccd.org, and it should be under the workshop tab. I'm just going to scroll up here and see if there are any questions I had missed during the video. And of course, you know, if, if there's anything you'd uh, want to talk about more in depth with me, uh, by all means, feel free to contact me anytime. Um, and if you want me to come check your site out, I, I'd love to, you know, get an excuse to get out of get out of my house and go <laughs> check some plants out. So, I mean, nothing beats that. Someone asked if there was a borer starting to affect oak. Um, not that I know of. I'm, I'm not sure about borers, but I know that they do have a fungal disease going around, and they also have, which I think is also a fungus, um, but it's called sudden oak death. Um, and, and there's also oak wilt where their leaves just kind of start browning and, and falling off. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's definitely some diseases out there, but I'm not sure about um, pests and borers at this point. Uh, but it's very possible. Uh, someone asked if we have any native willows in Pennsylvania. We absolutely do. Um, one in particular that um, myself and a lot of other conservation district staff will recommend are black willows. Um, they absorb so much water, it's crazy, um, and they're actually really quick to establish. You can live stake with them as well. So if you can find one in the wild, uh, you can cut some stems off and get them for free. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a lot of native willows around here. And there's also a lot of non-native willows as well. So um, you need to be careful with that. But yeah, black willows are really great. Uh, someone asked how to tell a Japanese honeysuckle from a native honeysuckle. Honestly, that's a great question because I still can't figure it out. Um, so I'm <laughs> sorry I can't answer that question very well, but it is it is tough, um, definitely. And even native honeysuckles have uh, the tendency to spread around. So, yeah, it can definitely be tough to identify. And unfortunately, I don't have an answer for that. 
Uh, so not just Mile a Minute was the same as Greenbrier. It's not. Um, Greenbrier is more like a thick stem, uh, whereas Mile a Minute is like a little vine um, with these little prickly, sticky things that help them uh, attach on to something. So uh, two different plants. Um, someone asked about purple, purple dead nettle. Um, it is everywhere. Um, that's a native plant. It's actually edible, I just found out. Um, but yeah, I've seen that everywhere. It typically will come up um, as a ground cover, you know, until the, the grasses get tall enough to kind of cover it up. But yeah, they're definitely, they're natives and they, they're around here. Um, someone asked if it's a right to rake the dead silt grass away, um, and if that would spread the seeds. Um, don't quote me on this necessarily, but I uh, have been looking into how to manage uh, silt grass, and I guess they seed, I think it's uh, either beginning or late August. So they actually recommend waiting for it to go to seed or, or trying, to hit, trying to mow it right before it goes to seed. Um, so I think they, they, they recommend mowing silt grass. I'm pretty sure it's early August, but um, definitely try to look into that a little bit. You'll want to mow it before it goes to seed. Um, unfortunately, it's just a nuisance to try to, to manage the, the green. But if you can at least prevent it from going to seed, that can uh, prevent it from coming back the next year, which is crucial. Last is crown fetch is a noxious species or just invasive. Um, I don't know. I definitely know it's a non-native plant, um, but I don't think it's on the, the noxious species list, but um, I could be wrong there. When asked what is the best way to get native wildflowers to grow this summer without uh, new native babies getting overcome by new multiflora growth and other fast invasives? Um, you know, maybe consider buying a, a pollinator seed mix. Um, I actually did that in my own backyard. I didn't even till up any of the soil. Um, I just kind of threw the seeds on the ground and hoped that they grew. Um, and it actually worked really well. Um, so I would actually recommend just getting a seed mix. Um, it would probably be cheaper than getting some transplants anyway. Um, but, you know, if you did want to, you know, in, increase the growth of that and try to avoid multi flora rows from coming in beforehand, uh, yeah, definitely check out some nurseries on that link that I had before. Um, hopefully that'll give you some sources. Um, but yeah, definitely. Uh, I think that if you at least seed the area and watch it, maybe seed and mulch, and then you can kind of check to see what growth you're getting. Um, and if you're able to identify the multiflora rows when it's young, maybe you can just hand pull that um, before it becomes a bit different problem. So any other questions, you know, native plant or non-native plant, um, or just feedback. If you guys are really into these uh, webinars, I'm, I'm happy to continue doing these, uh, maybe on like a monthly basis. Um, so if you guys are interested in that, please let me know. Or if you have any topics in particular, um, I'd love to talk about them. Wild edibles, okay. I might have to uh, touch myself up on those, but I may be able to do that in, in, in a few months. Yeah, we're thinking about doing these maybe like once a month, just on a regular basis, but yeah, wild edibles, that's a great uh, topic. Yeah, I'll definitely look into that. And if not, I might be able to find someone that um, is an expert in the field and have them post it as well. So we can see, there's definitely possibilities. One of the topics I was thinking about doing was what I, I had mentioned earlier with the different conservation areas in, in Columbia County. Um, so I was wondering if you guys would be interested in hearing about specific areas that we have and seeing some photos of, of native plants in their native environment and, and cool things like that. Um, so if that's something you're into, um, that'd, be very, that'd be very cool to do. 
something on. Wild mushrooms. We can definitely do that. We can definitely have a mushroom talk. Pictures on an individual slide. Yeah, that's a great, that's good feedback. Yeah, for sure. You can definitely make sure that you guys have um, some, some good viewing sizes and, and maybe I can have those photos available if someone wanted to zoom in or something. Yeah. We got about 10 minutes left. You know, if there's any other questions you guys have, uh, send them my way. Uh, the plant app that I mentioned, I'll type it in here. It's called iNaturalist. Um, I actually love this app because um, it actually is linked to a whole bunch of organizations that actually use the data. So it's very cool. You, it, um, I use it all the time. You just go out and find a plant that you're interested in, whether you know what it is or not. Um, take a photo of it, and then it will actually have a button where it will give you suggestions what it is. Um, I have no idea what the algorithm is, but it's the coolest thing in the world because it's almost always correct. Um, and it's not even just plants. I've done it with, like, bird feathers. Um, you can do it with wildlife. and it, It's really interesting. It's also interesting when you upload a photo of yourself to it. Um, according to that, I'm a loggerhead sea turtle. Um, so. Um, but it's a really fun app that you can you can play with. I highly recommend it. It's very cool. And then if you you know if you add certain data points like uh, location or time um, or or you know just different uh, like the climate, um, that data is saved in this database where um, a lot of organizations like the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage will actually use that data so that they can assess um, you know how healthy are our ecosystems and, and kind of. You know, use citizen science as a way of, of finding that out. A good app to insect. Oh, well, actually, iNaturalist will also do insects. Um, I, that's just my favorite app. I haven't really played with too many other ones. Um, there are some apps that are specialized. So I know that like Cornell has a special bird app, so they can help you identify a bird sound or a bird, uh, you know, from a photo. Um, so I'm sure somewhere out there there's an insect ID. Um, I know they also have um, apps that are specific for plants. Um, so yeah, there's, there's an app for everything out there. But yeah, I'm sure there's one for insects. But I, I would recommend iNaturalist because it kind of, it just does them all. Um, so you kind of have everything in one place. Any other questions out there? Uh, good one for bark and twig. It seem to work well. Hmm. I'm not sure about. Bark is actually really tough because certain species will have similar bark and, and it can kind of be confusing to identify a tree based solely on the bark. Um, Obviously, you'd want to go with the leaf if you're trying to identify it, but that can be very difficult um, in the wintertime because there's no leaves. Um, but I think that in the wintertime, the best way to identify a tree is actually by looking at the bud um, as opposed to the bark or the twig. Um, so I've actually never done it that way. Um, but if you can probably try it out and, and take a photo of like a bud uh, during the wintertime and see if iNaturalist will identify that. Because um, again, like barks and twigs, so it would just be really difficult, especially with their algorithm. They're kind of probably all going to look the same. Uh, book on uh, trying to identify the winner is excellent. Awesome. What kind of what book is that? 
Oh, okay. There, there are some great books out there. There's a little uh, pocket field guides I know um, that'll help you identify things in the winter, which is pretty cool. Actually, one of the best times to go and collect uh, the live stakes that I keep mentioning about is actually during the winter. Because um, those guys, you know, it's, they're all these squiggy little uh, shrubs and you can actually identify them, you know, by the buds. So if you guys are thinking about live stakes, actually wintertime is one of the best ways to go scout them. And the best time to collect them are either spring or fall. How, the, how tall does Japanese silk grass grow? Um, personally, I, we keep mowing it around here. I think most people mow it, but honestly, it can get really tall. Um, I'm not sure exactly how tall, but I know it can, it can certainly be a nuisance where it's tall enough that the mower may not be able to handle that. Um, so yeah, definitely, if you have it, try, try to get rid of it. Uh, I just looked it up. It can get up to six feet. So yeah, uh, not, not something we want to encourage. I got about four minutes here until the webinar is going to uh, end on me. But if you guys have any other questions, uh, talk them through the chat box. Um, or if not, again, there's my contact information. Um, I'd love to chat with you about any of your questions. And if you want me to come check out some area of your property and give you some suggestions, um, or if you're interested in any of those project opportunities that we have, uh, definitely give me, a, give me a call and we'll see what we can do. Dump cabbage. Will they increase or try that more? I honestly don't really know too much about stump cabbage. I know that it's all over the place right now. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure. I don't, I've, I've never really seen stump cabbage before available for like transplanting. Um, but that would be interesting. I, I wonder if they put anything out that prevents other things from growing um, that possibly could help with some, some invasive species or some multi-floor rows. But yeah, I'm actually not sure that that's just me talking out loud. Uh, so yeah, that'd be interesting to look into though. Something you could consider is, is possibly just, uh, you know, introducing a, a water loving plant of some sort or even a tree uh, that prefers, you know, hydric soils, um, like a sycamore or something that really likes, uh, you know, tree sides and stuff like that. So that's something else you can consider. All right, so welcome, Lincoln. It's about time for me to wrap up. Um, but I really appreciate you guys coming in here and hanging out with me and talking about uh, native plants. I mean, what can be more exciting? Uh, so if you guys want to check this out later on, uh, hopefully by the end of the day, I'll have this up on the website um, so you can see the slides and get these links again. Uh, but definitely, you know, you know, check back out. Um, uh, sign up for our newsletter so you can stay updated. You know, if we do continue doing this on a monthly basis. Um, I'd love to invite you guys back here. So uh, let me know any feedback or questions you have. Um, and with that, I'm going to stop the video here. But I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. And I hope you fare well uh, with, the, with the snowstorm we have on the way.